in management, the only guy left without a contract is Masai. How important, and I think we all know the answer, but how important is Masai to this organization? It, it doesn't, this, this Raptors turnaround is um, in part with Masai and Kyle, but also Masai being very smart in who he has decided to be on this team, like the trades that he has made, the organizational decisions with the 905. Um, you see, we are in this conversation. I haven't even brought up the 905 once. Like, that's surprising on my end. Like, 905 is part of my personality trait. But Masai Ujiri, this show does not run without Masai Ujiri as well. Um, I remember they scooped him from Denver. I'm pretty sure he was with Toronto for a little bit, but they scooped him from Denver. Uh, and basically since the, um, yeah, back in 2013, they took him for a five-year, $15 million deal. They had to replace Colangelo, who was just like, signing and trading Europeans like all the time, like Andrea Bargnani, Hito Turkoglu, like not, not a Jose Calderon, like I love Jose, but like just signing and just getting all these European guys. And they just had to find another dude who could do it. And without Masai, Masai has made the tough decisions that have been criticized over and over again, but have worked out for this team. Firing Dwayne Casey after the yeah. best Raptor seasons in history. 59 wins almost 60 wins 59 wins but choked in the playoffs choked in the playoffs trading away DeMar DeRozan franchise icon DeMar DeRozan and I think if DeMar stayed and they continued on this way the conversation for best Raptor would be uh I think it would be a little bit more um I think there would be a little bit more competition between DeMar and Kyle because for a long time I'll admit I was on the DeMar DeRozan train my argument was this guy was so good for so long that you were able to flip in and flip him into the dude that was that could take the Raptors there. But that's kind of a double-edged sword, backhanded compliment, unfortunately. But he has made the tough decisions and he has bet on guys when no one saw it, like Fred Van Vliet signing him to a two-way deal or the last last roster spot, letting him play it out with the bench mob, drafting Pascal at 27, and people said who? Who is this guy from New Mexico State? Um, just Terrence Davis, Matt Thomas, like the list goes on, Bismack Biombo, just finding these guys that have been undervalued, their careers, taking them there, giving them chances to succeed. And with, without him, without those guiding principles of betting on guys, but also not being too afraid to pull the plug when it's not working, has made... Masai Ujiri indispensable. I'm not sure what the Raptors look like without him. Mm. So you talk about, about um, Biombo, which who I learned is still in the NBA today. Great name. Speaking of names, I did not know Masai used to be in, in Denver, you said, right? Yeah. You guys know why they're called the Nuggets? <laughs> do we all remember that? Inside yes, joke. sponsored yes. by McDonald's. I, I do remember the conversation. I don't remember why they're called How the I forgot to ask. Will about that is beyond me. Oh. Is it the gold rush? Yeah. 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 It's the gold rush. Yeah. That's great. I love it so much. Um, what did right. you think it was at first, Adam? I didn't know. That's why I kept asking Will. He wouldn't tell me. You he just accepted it. That, oh, nuggets. Okay. He's <laughs> like the gold rush. I'm like, thank you. I almost wanted to say, I think, I forget what article he did, but I wanted to say, why don't you just do one explaining the names behind every single NBA team? <laughs> That would be that would be a good that'd be a good article. Oh, there you go, Donald. There's you can take that. <laughs> Historically, <laughs> the Raptors have uh, the Histor original Raptors have been around Toronto. Yeah. Historically, dinosaurs lived in Toronto. Like yeah. that's why we're called the Raptors. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, though. <laughs> um. So you talk about the championship because you know it's so boy, it's fresh, but at the same time, God has in the last year felt like a lifetime. Um. I, I want to get some of your memories of that run because if you were in Toronto, like in, around the downtown or even on a go trade, you knew the atmosphere and the deeper they got. I remember I was on my way back from Burlington to Pickering. Right. And like, there were some bad nights, but this one, it was just, it might've been a home, like a, one of the final games. And it was like the upper end, like the lower levels. It's just everyone in the aisle, you know, like six people trying to get into one four seater there. It was, oh, it was something else. 
Um, what memories do you have of that run and, and being around the city itself? So it was, so it was interesting. I was taking a summer, I was taking a summer school course at the time. So I was downtown pretty consistently and yeah. I don't, I don't live that far from Ryerson campus. I live about 25 mm-hmm. minutes away in the East end. Mm-hmm. So I was also writing about, I was also writing about the Raptors one and just the first game when they lose to Orlando on that miscommunication on defense between Kawhi and Marc Gasol, which you never see two top tier defensive players switch the pick and roll. They get missed. They get mismatched and DJ Augustine steps into an open three. I was like, here we go. Same old Raptors. It doesn't matter if it's DeMar DeRozan or Kawhi Leonard. It's the same old Raptors, but no, it wasn't. It wasn't the same old Raptors. And yeah, you bring it up. There was some bad losses. When the Raptors went down 2-1 to Philadelphia, I was like, I don't know. Like, Joel Embiid was doing the airplane. He was going. He was dunking. That. Like, I, w- I was worried because I, I want to believe in the Philadelphia 76ers so bad. But, you know, they had to slog it out in that seven-game series. Of course, everyone remembers that buzzer beater. I audibly yelled in my mom's ear when that happened and my neighbors next door were going crazy and everyone was going crazy. And the moment we made it to the conference finals, I was like, there's a shot. Like Milwaukee has been a juggernaut this year. Golden state is golden state. They've won two of the last three years, three of the last four years. Like there's a, there's an actual chance for this team to do it because although they have that one elite guy that can push it to the next level with Kawhi, they have enough role players and enough dudes to get it out. And even though by the time, I was getting to the end when they were playing eight guys. The only dudes coming off the bench were Fred, Norm, and Serge. Even though Fred was coming off the bench, he was basically the fifth starter because he would start the second quarters over Danny Green. I was like, there's a shot. There's a shot. And even though they went down 2 nothing to Milwaukee, I, was, I, I wasn't worried. Like, obviously, that, that comeback, sweeping the next four games. Like, Milwaukee had not lost more than two in a row, I believe, that season. They lose four in a row. Just... It was something it was something different with this team. It was something different with this run. Obviously, Kawhi was a huge part of it, but I believe part of it was like the Raptors fans like stopped believing for a little bit, especially after that, after last year's or the 2018 playoffs, they got swept by the Cavs and there was just like no hope. Like LeBron was just doing whatever he wanted. I'm pretty sure he spun the ball and shot a three in Serge Ibaka's face that playoff run, hit a hit a had a game, a running game winner over OG. Like no matter anything the Raptors were doing that year, it just was not working. And then to see it change and see the personnel changes, Danny, Kawhi, Mark, the growth of Pascal, the growth of Fred, the continued, the changing of Serge Ibaka's game, the changing of Norm's game, and Kyle Lowry being the steadying hand that calms all types. It was, I can't put it into words being there for that, um, that parade i can't put it into words seeing that crowd how big it was down in uh, nathan phillips square how busy the city was it it was an undescribable experience and the, the other thing that i would add is it brought it kind of brought the country together because they had different watch parties all around the country like there's watch parties out in bc i bet there was watch parties out in quebec there's watch parties everywhere watching the playoff run and it was like the country was invested in this team in toronto and it was kind of like a win for the country, even though Toronto fans will be like, it's like, it's a Toronto win, like it's a Toronto team. But it definitely, I feel like the whole country took pride and the continued growth of Canadian basketball signifies that. The other thing that I would say was just like regular fans or fans or people who don't even watch games were getting invested as well. Like out of my friend group, I'm the only one who likes sports and it's weird. Like with my friend group that I've been friends with for a long time, I'm the only one who is like into sports like this much. They're not like into it as well. It's like if a game is on, they'll watch it. But like they have better things to do with their time than like worrying about if Kyle Lowry's going to leave in whatever, how many months. But they were getting invested as well. And we watched, like we actually watched games together. And I was like, whoa, like we're actually like watching basketball games together, like under any normal circumstance, like any playoff run, like we would not be doing that. So it was, it was crazy. It was, it, I can't, I can't put it into like words. 